Welcome to the Friday night edition of Navarro Live. I'm Michael Walker. I'm joined by Aaron Bastani. And I always enjoy our Friday evenings together, Aaron. But today, you know, all my nerdy juices are flowing because it's an hour of election analysis we have to look forward to. What, nerdy and tired, Michael? I don't know about you, but I slept about uh, two hours last night, three hours, and then about three hours the night before. I had the great fortune of being uh, uh, someone who does the sampling at my wife's election. So I was checking that there was no uh, breaking of the rules and uh, trying to work out who was voting for who. So very exciting, very tiring. But my God, Michael, I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> A rule enforcer. I always say uh, on Twitter, I always see sort of all the political journalists where they're saying, oh, I'm staying up all night. I'm going to get up really early. I just get up when I normally get up and look at what the results are. I suppose I, I'm not someone who does live reporting. I just do my show at 7 p.m. So my priority is to get some rest so I can give you some decent analysis when the time comes. The time has come. One of the first results that came through today um, was for the by-election in Blackpool South. Now, that by-election was happening because the incumbent Tory MP had resigned over a lobbying scandal. And the results were pretty catastrophic for the Conservatives. So Labour took the seat with 59% of the vote, up 20 points from 2019. The Tories ended up with just 17.5%, down 32 points from 2019. Now, it could have been worse, though, as the Tories only just beat reform into third place. Their candidate finished on 16.9% of the vote, just 117 votes behind the Tories. So the Tories could have come third. Keir Starmer was in Blackpool this morning to celebrate the results. Here in Blackpool, a message has been sent directly to the Prime Minister directly to the Prime Minister, because this was a parliamentary vote. This was directly to Rishi Sunak to say we're fed up with your decline, your chaos and your division, and we want change. We want to go forward with Labour. And Chris, you've smashed that. That wasn't just a little message. That wasn't just a murmur. That was a shout from Blackpool. Personally, I would have gone with roar. That was a roar from Blackpool, not a shout from Blackpool. But oratory was never Sakir's main selling point. Um, and, you know, Labour have had a, a decent day. You've got to hand it to them. Um, uh, for the Tories, this has been an absolute disaster. Um, so let's look at the, the latest results. Um, so the Tories have lost 346 seats now, which means that they've, they've lost more seats than they've won. So more than... Oh, Almost, actually, not quite. So almost 50% of the seats they stood in, they have lost, which is really, really catastrophic. Um, Labour up 139. Um, decent. Um, the Lib Dems up 64. The Greens up 43. Independents up 83. That's a big story of the evening. Um, we can also look at the council. So this is, I suppose, what really matters to people because it's who your council is and what party controls your council that's going to make most difference to your life. Um, Labour have a net increase of seven councils. Um, so they gained control of nine councils. They lost control of two. Um, the Conservatives are down six councils. I mean, they've only managed to hold five, as you can see, that they weren't contesting um, that many um, in this round of elections. Um, in terms of the councils that Labour won, they include Hartlepool, Farrock, Milton Keynes, Rushmore, Hindburn, Cannock Chase, and Nuneaton, and Bedworth. Um, one of the councils Labour did lose was Oldham. Now, that was in part thanks to pro-Palestine independence um, winning seats there. Um, Labour also lost control of Kirkley's council. Now, we'll talk in detail um, later in the show about Labour's Gaza problem. For now, though, let's stick with Tory losses and look at what Rishi Sunak had to say about his party losing so many councillors and councils. It's disappointing to lose good, hardworking Conservative councillors, and I'm grateful to them for all their service in local government, keeping council tax low and delivering services for local people. But we've still got lots of results to come as well. Just for And there are also things that I would point to. Harlow, for example, where Keir Starmer held a rally just on Wednesday saying that was a place that he had to win, to be on track to win a general election. That hasn't happened. And indeed, we're still waiting for the result in the Tees Valley Meralty, uh, just near to here which is obviously a very important test as well. Do you need to convince your party you can do better in a general election? 
Well, as I said, if Keir Starmer was in Harlow on Wednesday saying that was a place that he needed to win in order to win the next general election, that hasn't happened. We still haven't got the results from places like Tees Valley with the mayoralty results, which again is a key battleground. That was Rishi Sunak telling journalists to wait for the results in Tees Valley before coming to any firm conclusions. Um, And that race did, in the end, go the Tories' way. So Ben Houchin retained the mayoralty with 54% of the vote to Labour's 41%. But it was much closer than last time around. Compared to 2021, the Tories are down 19 points and Labour up 14. So while the result is a relief for Houchin, it's unclear... Um, those results should be a cause for celebration for the Tories more generally. And according to number crunchers at the BBC, if the Tees Valley swing from Tory to Labour was repeated across the northeast of England at a general election, the Conservatives would lose all of their seats in the region. Right? So not exactly something for Rishi Sunak to be celebrating. Um, in his post-win interview with Sky, Ben Hoochin was asked about the prospect of working with Keir Starmer. Well, I already work with uh, the five of the five councils that I represent or uh, cover the area for. Um, there are already four Labour councils, and now, as of last night, Hartlepool have there are five Labour councils. When I was first elected in 2017, there were five Labour councils. So again, like I say, I work with anybody, Labour, Conservative, Independents, to get what I need to get done so for would local you, if, people. If, if, um, if I think there's a long way to go to the general. If Keir Starmer's prime minister, would you be able to work with Keir Starmer? Absolutely. I mean, Keir Starmer's come out and said that he's going to double down on devolution, which is a huge change. It's a 180 from what Labour did in 2019 when they were talking about abolishing theirs. Now Keir Starmer's saying he's going to give us more money and more powers, which gives me more autonomy to get on and do what I do best, which is deliver for local people. That almost sounded like an endorsement of the Labour leader. He's saying, well, Keir Starmer said he's going to give me more money and me more power. Right? That just doesn't really sound like you're telling people to vote Tory at the next general election. Um, Labour have had some actual wins as well um, in mayoral seats. So in the newly created um, mayoralty of York and North Yorkshire, and that includes Rishi Sunak's constituency, um, Labour's David Scaife won with 35% of the vote. That was on a turnout of just 30%. It's not, you know, it's not, not a huge, overwhelming win, but uh, it's enough. Um, Labour's Claire Ward has been elected fir- the first mayor of East Midlands. She beat Conservative Ben Bradley by more than 50,000 votes. Labour also won the newly created role of mayor for the North East. Um, so Labour's Kim McGuinness received 41% of the vote, beating the independent Jamie Driscoll on 28%. That was on a turnout of 31%. So appearing on our show the day before the election was not enough to get Jamie Driscoll over the line. We will be talking more about that race later in the show. Um, other big results Um, We don't know yet. So results for the election to London Mayor and Mayor of the West Midlands will be announced tomorrow. Both are thought to be incredibly close. So what does the aggregate of all these results tell us about the state of play of politics in England and Wales? Well, veteran pollster John Curtis summarised the Tory losses on Times Radio. The Conservatives are losing votes most heavily in places where they were previously strongest in 2021 which is a replication of a pattern that was there in last year's local elections and has also been picked up by a lot of polling since. So it's that underlying pattern that I would pick out as the thing that should worry the Tories. In other words, it's not just that their vote is down, but the the geography of party support, which favoured them so strongly in 2019, now looks as though it's risk of working against them, thereby exaggerating the scale of their, potentially exaggerating the scale of their defeat in any immediate uh, general election. But, you know, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. So I thought that was really interesting. So what he's essentially saying there is that sort of the Labour Party, yes, it it won um, fewer votes in total than the Conservatives in 2019. But also it wasn't helped by the fact that its support was concentrated in certain safe seats, mainly in sort of inner cities, places that voted remain. And the Tory vote was much more spread out and which meant that sort of their votes translated into more seats. And John Curtis is saying that Actually, um, now the Labour vote is quite efficiently distributed, um, which I suppose, you know, credit to Labour, that was their strategy. We would need to win back older voters in the Red Wall. Um, They seem to have done that to some extent. Um, In terms of what this means for a general election, the BBC do a projected national vote share, which shows what general election results would be if everyone voted in the same way in a national election as they did in these local elections. And they've got this up here. So they say Labour on 34%, the Conservatives on 25%, and the Lib Dems on 17%, with others 
on 24%. Now, this would obviously make Labour the largest party, but it wouldn't give them a majority. So I've seen some people on Twitter say, I thought Labour was supposed to get a landslide. I actually think this projected national vote share is a bit pointless and ridiculous because people don't vote in general elections in the same way that they do in local elections. Like the Lib Dems are not going to be getting 17% and independents are not going to be getting over 20% in a general election. So to me, this is still pointing towards a Labour landslide. Um, Aaron, what's your big takeaway from the results we've got so far? Well, just to say, Michael, I think on the national sort of... Um data. I don't think it's data. Like you say, it's, it's ridiculous, frankly. And obviously, don't forget, it's not including Wales and Scotland. Uh, Scotland would be pretty significant. Um, yes, 34%. It could be a massive Labour majority, actually, if the Tory vote collapses. You know, if the Tories get 20% and Labour get 34%, then that's still a very big majority. Don't forget, in 2005, Labour won a big majority, significant majority, under Tony Blair, with only 35% of the vote. Um, so Scotland will matter a lot, even if they get below 40%. We're in a very strange situation where Labour could get less than 40% of the vote and have an extraordinary, historic, potentially, a majority. So winning less as a share of the vote than Labour in 2017, yet forming a government with a sweeping majority of MPs in Parliament. In terms of the stories around the country, well, we're going to talk about that for the rest of the hour. Uh, but I do think that localism, is just a fascinating prism through which we need to understand all of this. You know, the Tories who've survived, like Ben Houchen, potentially Andy Street in the West Midlands tomorrow, they have survived precisely because they're presenting their politics as that of local champions. And I actually think this itself betokens the extent of Tory collapse. If you say I am a national conservative politician, I identify with the Conservative Party at Westminster, you're toast, you're finished, you're fucked. Um, and I, I think that really does augur very badly for them. I've spoken to a ton of people today, journalists, activists. They say two fascinating things. Firstly, nobody is enthused or excited about Labour. Nobody. Labour activists and candidates tell me that. Or journalists who want Labour to do really well, they tell me that. Uh, but they also say Labour's heading for a large majority. And thirdly, and this is really fascinating for me, this is existential for the Conservatives. This is genuinely existential for the Conservatives. And it's not existential because reform are gobbling up their votes and taking all their activists and taking all their, their people and the attention that they would normally garner in the, in, in the air war and whatnot. There is just this bizarre deflation of British conservatism. At the same time that we still see, you know, immigration is a, is a massive issue for people in, in British politics, like it or not. Um, at the same time as we see people saying, the UK economic model isn't working. Um, many people agree that, you know, we should have, and again, I don't agree with this, but this is what you hear. Uh, we should have fewer people on you know, sickness benefits. We should have fewer people in work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On a case-by-case -case basis, Rwanda, on a case-by-case -case basis, these are all actually quite popular talking points, or at least not incredibly unpopular. And yet that's become entirely detached from the conservative political brand. Um, so really, really fascinating for me, in so many ways. And Michael, seeing Keir Starmer there in Blackpool, which was a massive result for Labour, I, I don't feel like I'm seeing a prime minister. It's really strange. Now, you can have an extraordinary prime minister, very good problem solver, administrator, policy person, all those things, and be terrible at PR and media. I don't want a showman who ultimately leads the country um, on the highway to hell. I don't want that. But it really is quite interesting how he can't even meet a minimal threshold for charisma, persona, just being somebody you, you would sort of associate with leading a country like the UK. Yeah, I mean, as I said, it, it wasn't a particularly sort of impressive victory speech, but it was an impressive by-election result. And um, uh, let's sort of return to, to focus on this by-election. It's what we sort of started our roundup with. Um, and it conforms, actually, to the result in Backpool South with a pattern of Labour under Keir Starmer doing incredibly well in by-election. So this graphic from Sky shows the 10 biggest by-election swings to Labour from the Tories since 1945. Now, Blackpool South is the third biggest swing since 1945 in any by-election. And this is the, the really big stat, right? Six of the 10 biggest swings in the last 80 years, to Labour, of course, have been in the last two years. Now, Aaron, that is a, 
you know, if, if you're going to look at sort of arguments as to why Labour are going to win a big majority, or, or, you know, why Labour might win a big majority at the next general election, the fact that six of the, the 10 largest swings to Labour in by-elections in the past 80 years have happened in the past two years, that's, that's a big deal. That is something that, you know, him and his team can be proud of, right? It, look, it's a huge deal, Michael. It, it may be that actually in contemporary politics, because of how it's just changed, it is far better to be a bit of a non-entity and be able to um, resist the attack lines of your opponent rather than be somebody who can make this big sort of propositional statement politics and be charismatic. We saw that with Biden Trump, right? Biden wasn't really offering very much, you know, in terms of the air war, in terms of media, he wasn't, you know, especially captivating, but he was very good at pacifying, mitigating the attacks from Trump. Starmer probably is is capable of doing something quite similar. And that, that matters, by the way. In 2017, Corbyn managed to get 40% of the vote. But you know what? Lots of people also disliked him, disliked his policies. He wasn't able to navigate various issues around, you know, who he was, his political brand, etc. I obviously disagreed with that, but that was just the facts of the matter. So if you can get 40% of the vote, but your sort of political prospectus means that your opponent gets 42, 43, that doesn't matter. But you can get 35 and take the heat out of those attack lines and your opponent subsequently deflates like the Tories have, clearly that's important. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting otherwise, Michael. But I, I do think, and I, this might sound cliche, or because I'm on the left, I'm trying to uh, poo-poo Starmer's achievements. I'm not. What I'm trying to underscore, though, Michael, is that those results you just showed, some of the stuff we've seen around England, is because of Tory collapse. It is because of Tory collapse. And we could talk about why that is. Um, I think it's a bunch of variables. I think actually it's probably quite slow. It's probably been going on for quite a while. Brexit, Johnson managed to puff it back up again. Demographic change, the fact that most of their votes are skew older. Even in 2019, when they get this huge majority, um, Labour win more votes under 65 than the Tories do. I mean, that suggests something interesting, even, even the jaws of, of a historic defeat for Labour. So... I, I think we are seeing something very existential for the Tories. And I know people say that all the time. Compare this to 97. In 1997, the Tories got, I think, 32% of the popular vote. If they get that at the next general election, it would be an astonishing achievement. I don't think they will, frankly. Um, there, are, there, are, there are polls out there now putting them below 20%. And that's not because, you know, Keir Starmer is so um, wonderful or because reform's doing such a great job. Their people simply aren't turning up, Michael. Their people simply aren't turning up. I was um, I was doing, like I say, samples in Portsmouth City Council. My wife was a councillor. She managed to triple her uh, her majority in her ward despite having a six-month-old baby, which is obviously a, a great achievement for her. But I was looking at the samples as they were coming through. And then, of course, you check uh, the voting. There's a, there's a sort of separate thing afterwards. We were tallying, tallying things up. Um, and... I was just shocked. My jaw dropped at how badly the Tories were doing. And I know that's just one ward in one constituency, but bear in mind, Michael, there's Penny Mordaunt in the north of Portsmouth. The Conservatives in that same ward would, would finish second regularly until a couple of years ago. Now they're getting fewer votes than the Greens. You know, it was huge pile Lib Dem, huge pile Labour, OK pile Greens, OK pile Independent, and then the Tories were, were nowhere. And I think that's the story in a lot of places. And we might see over the next 10, 15 years, you know, Labour becomes the hegemonic party of, of the British centre, centre-right. They will have some centre-left policies, I don't doubt that. But the sort of um, business-friendly, um, sort of uh, polished statesman-like politics you associate, say, with Cameron, although, of course, austerity was an absolute clusterfuck, in terms of how he presented himself, Cameron and Osborne, 2010 to 2015, or even 2016, I, I think Labour will will probably step into that. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't bode well if you want an anti-austerity political economy. But I think in terms of how they'd want to represent themselves and present their sort of government, it would be like that. A government in the national interest, very much of the centre. And I think you can only do that when the Tories have collapsed, right? And the Tories have collapsed. And of course, going back to your original point, Starmer and his people would say, well, they've collapsed precisely because I've stolen their clothes from them. Yeah, I, I think that's the key thing for me. So there's this two... Uh, this dichotomy it, are these huge swings because of dramatic enthusiasm for the for the Labour Party or the collapse of of the Tories? Now it's clearly not for huge enthusiasm for the Labour Party. I mean the polls show this. I think Keir Starmer is about as as popular as John Major was in 1996. Right there, there isn't massive popularity for for the Labour Party, but I think the Labour Party can take some credit for the collapse of the Conservative Party because one of the reasons, obviously, that 
Um, I, I think the Conservative Party have struggled to motivate people to go out to the polls is because no one's particularly scared of Keir Starmer. They might not be inspired by him, but they're not scared of him either. And I also think that lots of sort of the crises within the Conservative Party have been because they're not polling that well. You know, so it's a, if, if, if um, you know, for, as much as I agree with his politics, if sort of Jeremy Corbyn by 2019, someone with that sort of popularity had been in charge in, in you know, last year or the year before, I don't think Boris Johnson would have resigned because he, you know, it, it would still look like he could win a general election. So sort of uh, the fact that Keir Starmer has sort of kept the Tories on their toes is one of the reasons they've collapsed, I think. Um, it's not necessarily a particularly sort of positive vision of politics, but you, you've got to say it's not a complete, the, the collapse of the Tories is not unrelated to the strategy which has been pursued by Keir Starmer and his team. Um, let's look at some results, which I imagine will be somewhat disappointing to many of our viewers. Um, it's the loss of Jamie Driscoll in the North East. Um, of course, he's the candidate who um, was blocked by Labour from standing, so stood as an independent. Now, on Twitter, he tried to put a positive spin on the results. So he said this, what an astonishing campaign. I'm in awe of everyone who gave their time, energy, resources and votes. When recent general election polling in the North East shows Labour with 60% of the vote, most commentators thought Labour would walk this the fact that we got 126,000 votes here, nearly as much as the Tories, Green, Lib Dem and Reform put together with no Westminster Party machine behind us, shows something is happening in the North East. This was a people-powered campaign and it doesn't die with just one election result. Tens of thousands of people voted for a different type of politics. And he says there is a huge appetite for pragmatic, transformative policies that reduce inequality and treat people with respect. We are building a movement and we're staying right here. So a very positive message um, from Jamie Driscoll, if you're wondering why it says Mayor Jamie Driscoll when he hasn't won this mayoral race, it's because he was um, the, the mayor of North of Tyne. Um, that uh, that role will, I, I assume, collapse now that they've made the, the mayor of the North East role. Um, speaking on the BBC, Labour's Jonathan Reynolds adopted a rather different tone. I'm absolutely delighted by that. I really am. Because you've got this added element there where it was a Labour versus independent contest. I very strongly believe Labour did the right thing in its candidate selection. That sometimes isn't always easy to do for a political party, but I do contrast, for instance, the approach we took in the North East with how I see a with no offence to you, Mark, a Conservative Party that doesn't do that, that has too many extreme views in it, doesn't stick to the mainstream, and how that pulls sensible people like you to the extremes when you're talking about 15-minute cities and that sort of thing. We have focused on the kind of, you know, genuine, reflective working class view, middle class view in the northeast of England, and Kim represents that, and that's a cracking victory for us. It's not very uh, magnanimous in victory. <laughs> do you say magnanimous in victory, or do you just say magnanimous in defeat? I don't know. <sighs> anyway, to, well, don't know, what, do you, what do you think about this result, and what do you think about those responses from, from the two, well, from, from Jamie Driscoll and John, Jonathan Reynolds? Well, Jamie Driscoll was, was always unlikely to win. Um, I had some sort of dweebs on Twitter pulling up an article I wrote uh, saying, oh, you thought he was going to win. No, I didn't think he was going to win. I said repeatedly, um, it's unlikely he'll win. There was a poll, of course, that had him 2% behind Kim McGuinness. But the reality is, particularly for a metro mayor, right, you're looking at multiple constituencies. It's not, it's not like you're running for a constituency, 70,000 people, like Islington North. This is multiple constituencies, rural areas included, very hard to do a ground campaign over such a large geographical area with so many people when you don't have a party organization, when you don't have the data. You know, Jamie Driscoll, if he was defending the North of Tyne mayoralty, which he was prior to this, I think he would have won. He knew the patch, he had the data, he had the political brand, but the 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 task was much harder because this was a mu this is now a much bigger job, much bigger budget, much bigger area the Northeast mayoralty, that is. So it was always very hard for him. I think, frankly, getting almost 130,000 votes is an extraordinary accomplishment. Absolutely. But the fact is, you lost. You did lose. Could he have won? He could have done better. I think it could have been closer. But what I think is often lost in um, social media um, first, and we do a lot of that here on our media, of course, as well, um, analysis of this stuff, is that, look, Kim McGuinness would have had tens of thousands of votes through postal votes sorted weeks ago. And that would be from data um, that Labour councils, Labour uh, constituency MPs or candidates have accumulated over years, decades, okay? Um, he, he didn't have any of that. 
He did not have any of that. So, okay, he might be trending on the hashtags or, you know, Durham Union might support him. Or if you do a Vox pop in, you know, this or that part of the area, I'm sure he does very well. But it is not the relentless approach you need for something this big. You know, it's a great phrase. I love it. It's a favorite phrase of mine. Amateurs do strategy, professionals do logistics. And I think if you're trying to be the Metro mayor of somewhere this large, you need a very experienced, coordinated, expert logistical operation. It's hard to do that as an independent. It's almost impossible to do that as an independent the first time round. Can he win next time as an independent? I don't know. He can do better because he has a lot more data, right? And he has a run-in time of more than what he had this time around of a year. But I, I think the wise thing for Jamie Driscoll is to stand again with a political party. I think that should be the Greens. Personally, I don't know his views. Maybe he doesn't align with them on this or that policy. But I think with the Greens, given how they're doing in the Northeast anyway, given the momentum they'd probably generate between now and, and the next time of asking for this particular role, I think he would stand a really, really good chance. That would be my two bobs worth. In terms of Jonathan Reynolds' response, I thought it was very low class. You've won. Uh, you don't need to call this man an extremist or insinuate he's an extremist. I know he was talking there about conservatives, but there was a there was a insinuation there that Jamie Driscoll had been ditched because he had extreme views. This is somebody, Michael, who's a former managing director of a software company, whose wife is an NHS GP, whose dad drove a tank in the British Army, whose brother uh, was in the Royal Navy. He's a former engineer. He's as centrist dad as you get. I think in a sensible, serious country, he would be a centrist dad. The fact that Jonathan Reynolds on the BBC has to claim he's an extremist tells you how extreme, actually, the permanent political class is. And I think Labour is, frankly, a part of that permanent political class. I think they're picking up so many votes now because the Tories no longer represent, to a large extent, the permanent political class. The, the Toryism of Ken Clark, of David Cameron, Michael Howard, that's, that's, that's really been gazumped by a form of right populism which hasn't actually worked out for them in the long term, and, and Labour are taking the bat on. I think it speaks volumes when Jonathan Reynolds, deputy chair, by the way, of Labour Friends of Israel, can call somebody like Jamie Driscoll, an extremist, or insinuate that, purely on the basis of him sitting next to somebody like Ken Loach. I find that utterly extraordinary. I thought it was low class from, um, from Jonathan Reynolds. I thought he didn't need to do it. Uh, and I think it, it tells you actually something about the, the, the morals of these people, or rather lack of them. You know, in, in private, I bet Jonathan Reynolds, quite like Jamie Driscoll, probably agrees with loads of what he says. That if they knew each other personally, they'd probably get on. But because a clique in London around Keir Starmer decided that Jamie Driscoll couldn't be the Labour candidate for the North East, Jonathan Reynolds has gone along and he's disparaged somebody who's a perfectly good, decent man when it wasn't necessary. While on the whole, Labour have had a good set of local election results, in a number of regions, they've taken a hit thanks to their handling of the war on Gaza. Now, the first signs of trouble came from Oldham. Labour lost control of that council after losing five seats um, and independents winning seven. Now, many of the winning independents ran on an explicitly pro-Palestine platform and Oldham has a large Muslim population. Um, Labour also had poor results in other wards with high Muslim populations in towns and cities across England, including Blackburn and parts of central Newcastle. And these were scenes at the Blackburn count. So the Blackburn independents won in all nine of the wards they contested. Now, as you can see, they're celebrating in front of Palestine flags and balloons in the Palestine colours. Um, in Rochdale, George Galloway's Workers' Party won two seats from Labour. They're obviously campaigning on Gaza. And in Manchester, a Workers' Party candidate took out the council's deputy leader. So the person who lost there was was Labour. Now, on average, according to the BBC, Labour's vote is down 11% compared to last year in wards where more than one in 10 residents identify as Muslim. Um, Chair of the Labour Muslim Network, Ali Malani, told the BBC Keir Starmer would have to work hard to win back Muslims' trust. We have heard Sir Keir Starmer say that the Labour Party is a changed Labour Party and we are desperate to see a Labour government. But that changed Labour Party cannot leave Muslim populations in the rearview mirror. We have to bear in mind Muslims historically have been amongst the most loyal supporters of the Labour Party. Uh, and we cannot now dismantle what has been decades and decades long relationship between Muslim populations and the Labour Party. My call to Sir Keir Starmer is please, please, this is the last warning. This is the 
last time we go to the polls before a general election. We have so much work to do with uh, regaining the trust of Muslim voters. And that begins by calling for an immediate arms embargo of Israel and making sure that Muslims feel like our, our voice and our lives matter equally to those of others. So Ali Milani there spoke about the need for Labour to win back the trust of Muslims. He was speaking to the BBC about half ten this morning. Within the hour, though, some in the party proved they had other ideas. So Rob Mayer is political editor of the BBC Midlands. And at 11.20, he tweeted this. Labour sources tell me they believe they have lost the West Midlands mayoral election, with their campaign severely dented by the issue of Gaza. They think independent Ahmed Yacoub will come third in some areas. Votes will, won't be counted till tomorrow. Then, this is the key bit, Labour source, quote, it's the Middle East, not West Midlands, that will have won the street. So that's the Tory candidate, the mayoralty. Once again, Hamas are the real villains. So saying Labour might lose the West Midlands, essentially because of Muslim voters, and this is because they support Hamas? That quote was read out on the BBC to Labour's deputy campaign coordinator, Ellie Reeves. Senior party, Labour Party sources said it's the Middle East, not the West Midlands, that will have won Andy Street the contest. Once again, Hamas are the real villains. A Conservative source has gone back to our political editor there saying that that quote is vile and they insist that the contest is extremely close. Yeah. So that issue coming up. Um, certainly there as well. Is that the language that, that people should be using? This is the first time I've heard this. Uh, well, this, well, that this, is the language. This, that's this, been... this, this, this quote. Um, and we need to see what happens uh, in the election in the West Midlands. I was, I was in the West Midlands yesterday uh, campaigning uh, and it wasn't where I was the issue that was coming up uh, on, the, on, the, on the doorstep. Right. But is that the language that Labour candidates, Labour councillors, Labour mayoral candidates should be using? Well, it's not the language that I would personally uh, use, um, but you know we need to see what happens with that result and analyse uh, you know, it, when they come out. But we haven't seen those results yet, Joe. So Ellie Reeves clearly hadn't been given her lines for that yet. She didn't know if she condemned it because no one had told her yet. The Labour Party would ultimately, though, condemn the comments from the source. So this is Rob Mayer again, so the, the, the Midlands political editor. A Labour Party spokesperson this time said... The Labour Party has strongly condemned this racist quote, which has not come from anyone who is speaking on behalf of the party or whose values are welcome in the party. Um, now, there is an ambiguity because Labour source, who is that? Right? Is that someone who's working for the Labour candidate in the West Midlands? Is it a councillor? Is it someone who knows Rob Mayer in some kind of Labour HQ? I mean, it's, it could be anyone, really, this Labour source. You'd assume, you know, this is someone working for the BBC that they would only share it if this was someone, you know, who, who had a reasonable claim to be speaking for Labour. Um, Aaron, what do you think of this? So both, I suppose, uh, this quote from the Labour source, but then also Labour's bigger problem um, in wards with high Muslim populations. It shouldn't be happening. Do not say a Labour source. Because for all we know, Michael, that could be some has-been, some former MP, some nobody, some influencer, Lord, um, saying something absolutely unacceptable. and And... I'm sure Keir Starmer thinks it's unacceptable. I don't sing the man's praises very often, but I, I, you know, I think he would say that's an unacceptable thing to say. Um, and it's attributed to Labour, and then they have to defend utter nonsense, utter crap. By the way, there are many ra racists in the Labour Party. This idea that Labour has always been an anti-racist party, not true. The West Midlands Labour Party, the, the bastion, the heartlands of the old Labour right, uh, very racist people, many of them. If you look at the Hodge Hill by-election in the early 2000s, Google that, Hodge Hill by-election, you'll see why I've said that. So um, I, I, I personally think it's very bad journalistic practice to, to say that when it's something negative about a party or when it's going to reflect badly on a party, I think it's bad practice. You know, if I think, if there's a story where it's, you know, huge public interest and exposing that person's um, status or profession or position could jeopardize their safety. Of course, as a journalist, you have a, you have a responsibility to them too. But, you know, this is, this is bordering on incitement's racial hatred. You know, you can't just say a Labour source, you know, for all we know, it's somebody that appeared on BBC Question Time last week as somebody who supports Labour. I, I don't even know what that means. It's such an expansive, capacious term. I don't think it helps. Journalists, political commentary, we're here to illuminate to clarify, to make sense of things, not make things so ambiguous and, and, and impossible to understand or comprehend. So I think that's the first thing. Shouldn't be happening. Very bad, very bad practice. Ellie Reeves' response also, Michael, I mean, you've already mocked it slightly, but it's just absurd and obscene. 
you know. Um, yeah, I'm I'm hearing in my earpiece right now. Yes, I can confirm it's racist. This isn't VAR, okay? We're not trying to check if a football crossed a, a goal line. We're not trying to double check if somebody's foot was offside. Somebody has just literally told you a racist statement, and you should be able to say that. Um, I understand you can't go, you know, to continue with the football analogy, studs up, because you haven't, you haven't been tasked with with doing that by the party leadership, I understand. It's very easy to say, I find those words personally abhorrent, and I'd be interested as to who said them because they're not something I would associate with anybody in the employ of the Labour Party. That's what you say. Very easy. I'm not an MP. I'm somebody who mouths off on Twitter, Michael, and comes on YouTube with you. And yet I think I've given a much more expert response than Ali Reeves did, by the way. One of the most senior people right now with regards to how Labour campaigns. So yeah, really astonishing thing to say. Um, I think the journalists, like I say, shouldn't be just repeating it in the way they do and not um, and not uh, and not naming them or at least saying what their job is or their relationship to the Labour Party is. And I think Ali Reeves' response as well, just, just the pits. But this really does underscore the point I made a moment ago. Labour has not always been an anti-racist party. When Corbyn said, I'm an anti-racist, uh, you had people like Tom Watson saying, we've always been anti-racist. Tom Watson was the election agent in the Hodge Hill by-election. In the by-election where we saw a ton of racism, Phil Woolis, Google Phil Woolis scandal. He was dealing in racist tropes in order to save his hide in the 2010 general election. He was defended from pillar to post by the entire Labour establishment, including Gordon Brown. So the only conclusion you can make from that is that these people don't really care about racism. You know, they care about it when it benefits them, when it's politically expedient. Oh, we can call Jeremy Corbyn and various people around him anti much. Great, we can get rid of him, get our people back in charge again. Fantastic, he's a racist. You hear a literal racist statement from somebody who's purportedly a Labour source. Uh, I don't know if it's racist. I'll have to check in my earpiece like it's VAR. Come on. The Greens have had another good round of local elections as we're speaking. Now they've gained 48 council seats. And that's including in areas they haven't traditionally performed well in. That's including Newcastle, Sefton and Redditch. Um, They haven't taken any councils so far, but are still hoping to do so in Bristol. So as we're speaking to you now, um, that hasn't been called. Um, Now, this is how their co-leader, Adrian Ramsey, spoke about the election results earlier this afternoon. In terms of council control, we won our first council last year in Mid-Suffolk in an area where I'm standing at the general election and we've got a fantastic chance. And we're looking to become the largest party on a number of councils, which you could well see later this afternoon. Places like Bristol, Worcester, Stroud and Hastings. We're certainly confident of gains, potentially becoming the largest party in some or all of those places. And then what that means for the general election is that in those places where we've got a big concentration of councillors, places like Bristol, Herefordshire, Norfolk and Suffolk, where I'm standing, there are seats in those areas where we're the main challenger to the incumbent. And people know that if they want to change and they want to see Greens in the next parliament to hold the next government to account, bring in the ideas for the bold action we need to protect our environment and defend public services, then they know they can vote for a group of Green MPs who will be that voice in parliament. That's sort of him laying out their sort of slow but steady strategy, I suppose. So we've talked about this before on the show. So the Nigel Farage parties, I'm so UKIP, Brexit party, whatever, they've got this big charismatic leader who is putting massive pressure on the Conservative Party because he's going to say, I'm going to help lose you some seats unless you do what I want. Now, I mean, UKIP did get some councils in sort of its, its heyday, but it's often been sort of a bit of a flash in the pan, um, those political projects. The Green Party haven't ever managed to put as much pressure on the Labour Party as UKIP or Brexit Party have on the Conservatives, but they have slowly built up um, sort of a, a political infrastructure, which seems somewhat durable. And you're saying we're slowly building up these these councillors. And then in more and more constituencies, it's going to seem reasonable to vote green because you've sort of seen some green councillors in, in action. So, you know, interesting, coherent. Um, and a bit later this afternoon, Ramsey's co-leader, Carla Denya, um, set out the party's pitch for the upcoming general election. It's clear that we're going to have a new government after the Mm. next general election so but whoever forms that government it will be better in my opinion and in the opinion of many voters in Bristol in Suffolk where my co-leader Adrian is standing and elsewhere if there are 
a handful, a small group, the next generation of mm -hmm. Green MPs there to hold the government to account, and to push them to be bolder on the areas where they're not so strong. So if it's a Labour government, that will be things like climate. Obviously, we know that the Labour Party U-turned on their headline climate pledge a few months ago. It will also be on things like decent investment in public services like the NHS. The Greens are the only party that are willing to be honest with voters that we need to make our tax system a little bit fairer, ask those with the broader shoulders to pay yes. a bit more so that we can invest in good quality public services for everyone. We're also the only party that would bring the water companies back into public ownership mm. to deal with the damage that decades of privatisation has done in terms of sewage All in right. our rivers. And voters across the country, across the political spectrum, um, are, are appreciating, they share our values, they support our policies, and they want to see more green selected. Aaron, I know you spend quite a lot of time thinking about the Green Party and Green Party strategy. I mean, how will they be um, thinking about these, these set of results? As I say, we don't quite know all of them yet, but we, we have an idea. Well, to the chagrin of some, I do GB News, as you know, Michael. Um, as you famously did once when calling out Paul Marshall, the guy who funds GB News. And a few months ago, obviously, everybody was talking about reform. And they were very keen to talk about reform because they have some reform people there, Richard Tice and, and obviously Farage. Um, as a show on GB News, and they were emphasizing how, you know, reform were there to really disrupt, um, to, to, to destroy the Tory party. And Ben Habib told me personally that the point of reform was to destroy the Tory party. They wanted to replace them and not be a pressure group like UKIP. And I remember saying to a few of them, well, look, it's great to have the air war and to be on BBC Question Time and you have this or that poll. It's great. It's great. But are you not worried you might be a flash in the pan? You know, the Greens have built up hundreds of councillors. Okay, it's taken years, but slow and steady can sometimes win the race. And they're certainly not a flash in the pan. You know, they've had a, an MP since 2010. I really hope they get a second one with Carla Denyer in Bristol Central. Um, of course, you don't want to lose the one they have. I think two or three MPs. Three MPs would be brilliant. I, I, if I had to bet today, I'd say two. You know, famous last words. I would say the Greens will get two MPs at the next general election. I think both before and after, though, there's clear momentum and I think they'll get many more councillors um, after that general election and I think they'll have a ton of second and strong third places to build on for the general election thereafter. And I find that approach in counterpoint to reform a better bet, right? So after 2010 or 2010 to 2016, you had these two kind of um, ideal types of campaigning. You had the Greens, like I say, slow and steady wins the race and you had Farage and UKIP, national media profile, always on the TV, populism. UKIP, okay, they, they, they got what they wanted with regards to the Brexit referendum. But in terms of the electoral legacy of UKIP, the Brexit party, okay, they got their MEPs, but reform isn't really doing particularly well. The right-wing Tories, who would be you know, on the same page with Farage in terms of policies and politics, most of them are about to lose their seats. So actually, fast forward to the day after the next general election, what is the electoral dividend of 15 years of right-wing populists being on our telly constantly, polling quite well. What's the dividend? I know about Brexit, but I'm saying in terms of domestic politics, it's very little. And so when I said this, I think actually, I think the Green approach is better than the, the, the Reform Party approach. They were kind of laughing at me. The Greens, the Greens, they don't get on telly. They don't have polls saying that they're on 20%. You know, they don't go on question time every day of the week, you know, every, every week, every Thursday. Um, they don't get headlines in, in national national titles like the Telegraph and the Times, the Greens. Well, yeah, that's because they're literally they're activists campaigning in wards and constituencies they want to win. You know, we can pretend there are shortcuts and, oh, if I'm a celebrity, then I can therefore become a national political figure. Yeah, work for Farage. Most of the time, that isn't how you enter elected politics. You have to actually persuade the 70,000 people in your constituency or whatever many thousand people in your ward if you want to be a councillor. They don't view it like that. And again, finally, I said this to Ben Habib. He stood in, um, was it Wellingborough, I think he stood in? Did quite well. I said, are you, are you going to stand again? Um, no. Uh, maybe the other one was Wellingborough. He was running the same night. They had two people running. I think it was Wellingborough, but he was running in a, in a constituency, in a by-election constituency. And I said, will you stand there again? No. What, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to hop from constituency to constituency, then the constituents who you want to vote for you are naturally and rightly going to conclude you haven't got their best interests at heart because you've only been there 10 minutes and if you don't win, you're going to leave again. 
Um, and so I said to him, look, no, you need to, you need to find, and Farage made this mistake, I think, you need to find a constituency and embed yourself in that community and say, I'm not going anywhere until I'm voted as an MP. If it takes 10 years, so be it. That seems to be what Jamie Driscoll is saying with regards to the Northeast. I think that's very wise. And it's something that, that, that the right, the radical right, don't really grasp. They get polling. They love to talk about, oh, X or Y issue is really salient with the public. They love to be on TV. But the bread and butter of politics is actually talking to, persuading people on doorsteps, getting them to vote for you. That's actually what it's all about at the end of the day. Take away all the, the bells and whistles. Uh, let's look a bit more in detail at reform. So Reform UK are boasting the results of the Blackpool South by election. Um, you know, show they're a big force in politics. They tailed the Tory candidate by just 117 votes. Um, their overall performance, though, is less impressive, having secured just one council seat across the whole country. On Times Radio, though, John Curtis explained why reform should have the Tories rattled. If you bear in mind that reform only fought one in six of the council seats, but the way they did fight, the Conservative vote was down on um, 2021 by about 20 points, which is well, well above uh, the kind of 10, 11, 12 point figure um, uh, elsewhere. So you can see how the Conservative vote was badly eaten into in the minority of wards where reform fought. And of course, the problem that the Conservatives face is that reform are determined to fight everywhere in the general election. In contrast, of course, to what happened in 2019, in a sense, reform are going to be a problem just by simply being on the ballot paper, irrespective of how popular they are, because it's bound to mean, because they weren't on the ballot paper in 2019, that they will do most damage to the Conservatives in seats that the Conservatives are trying to defend. Um, Aaron, as you know, the point you were making before is that you know it doesn't look like reform are going to sort of build or dig any roots anywhere, right? So it, again, I think at the next general election, I don't think they are going to overtake the Conservatives, but it does seem like they could really enhance Labour's majority. Um, how worried do you think um, the Tories are about that? Well, they're certainly going to do that. Um, you know, that, and that's what Galloway has said. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And that's what he said to me when I interviewed him on Monday. You know, he was saying that I want to do to Labour what reform are doing to the Tories. I want to stop them getting over the top um, in certain constituencies. You know, and I think that is reform strategy in the short term. Uh, they do have one eye, of course, on defeat and trying to repurpose the Tory party, both within the Tory party and beyond it with reform. They want to make that a, a, a wholesale party of the populist right after defeat. So um, that's, that's partly what they want to do. But before then, uh, yeah, clearly they're going to contribute to a, a significant defeat for the, for the Tories. And we, we've seen this in so many places, you know, the difference between the Tories just getting over the, just getting over the top, even if they've seen their vote collapse, you know, just getting over the top um, was uh, smaller than the reform vote. And that's going to happen in lots and lots of places. I suppose there's one reading of this which says, well, Galloway does something similar with Labour, and so they even each other out. Maybe. And that wasn't really what we were talking about, say, five months ago. This was uniquely a problem for the Tory party, you know, a, a separate party, which is really just uh, swallowing a big chunk of your voters. Now, that, that is going to be, I think, a problem for Labour as well, ahead of this election, but also going forward with the Greens, with, with left-wing independents and left-wing groups like the Workers' Party, not just them, though. I think there will be more. I think there will be a fragmentation of the left and centre left after Labour form a government. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think the real, the, mi the missing key here, and it won't happen, is Farage. If Farage was leading reform, I think they could get a higher voter percentage than the Tories, actually. Maybe you disagree, Michael. I think if reform were being led by Farage and he was just going on net zero and immigration, I think they could get low 20s. Actually, I think they could do that. I mean, would they get many MPs? Maybe one or two, maybe none. Um, but with Tice, they're not, they're not going to do that. And Farage, I think, has made that, that choice. You know, he's not on the pitch. He's not on the pitch, is he? You know, um, he's made that choice. And I think that's not entirely disconnected from the fact it's an election year in the US and he's good friends with Donald Trump. And he'd rather be in the US talking to thousands of people, making lots of money, being very influential, uh, rather than being on the, you know, the the, the Suffolk coast, or uh, uh, or Rochester, or I don't know, rural Dorset, um, banging the same drum he's been banging for twenty years. I think in his head he's done enough of that. He doesn't want to do it anymore. He doesn't want a ten-year slog to create a new political party. He doesn't want to do that. 
And I understand that, right, given his age. So I, I could have seen circumstances where reform actually did better than the Tories in terms of vote share, Michael. I, I didn't think it was likely, but I could, I could see it. And I think it was very possible if Farage was, like I say, on the pitch. But he's not. Um, Tice is not going to... Tice is not... Richard Tice is not going to lead a political party, which I think gets uh, a higher vote share than the Tories. Famous last words, I know. George Galloway has given a controversial interview to Novara Media. It included this exchange about homosexuality. So what specifically do you not like that's taught to children in schools? Well, I, I don't want my children prematurely sexualized at all. I don't want them taught that some things are normal when their parents don't believe that they're normal. Now, there's lots of things not normal. Doesn't mean you have to hate something that isn't normal. But if my children are taught that there's whatever the current Vogue number is, 76 or 97 or whatever the number of purported genders uh, that exist, I don't want my children taught that. But are they taught that? Uh, some of them are, yeah. I, are they? Because have... there's a huge, there's a huge, there's a huge gap here between saying. I think kids should be going to school and taught that, you know, not all relationships look like a heteronormative couple, male, female. There's a huge gap between saying they should know that there's lots of LGBT people in the world, the world is very diverse, that's what it looks like, and you're saying 96 genders. There's a, there's a big gap in between, isn't there? Well, no, three of my children go to school, a Catholic school in Scotland, so they have some protections for the moment, although the SNP government's threatening to remove some of those protections. Uh, but uh, my other two school children uh, are taught in England things that I don't want them to be taught. And at an age, I Such don't as. want them to, to be taught. That relations, uh, that gay relationships are exactly the same and as normal as a mom, a dad, and kids. I believe, I want my children to be taught that the normal thing in Britain, in society across the world, is a mother, a father, and a family. I want them to be taught that there are gay people in the world and that they must be treated with respect and affection as I treat my own gay friends and colleagues with respect and affection. But I don't want my children to be taught that these things are equal, because I don't believe them to be equal, apart from anything else. The human race would no longer exist. If, if it was normal, uh, then it would be the end of humanity over a couple of generations. <laughs> Aaron, lots of, that's gone very far. Um, on Twitter, lots of people talking about that clip. Some people saying sort of it was a gotcha. I mean, you were asking just very open-ended questions, and he managed to find himself in a position where he's saying homosexuality is not normal. He thinks mm. we should treat gay people with affection, while being very clear that they're not normal. Uh, what do you make of it? What's the significance of that? Well, it's the first time somebody's claimed that I've cancelled them when I've conducted a two-hour interview. Um, there's a lot here to unpack, Michael, and I think people can make their own minds up. I don't want to speculate about it too much because, of course, the interview itself is out on Sunday at 3 p.m. I think it's a brilliant interview, by the way. Very informative, for me anyway. Um, I asked these questions to George Galloway. I know he's a social conservative, and by the way, even though I don't agree with him on everything, particularly that stuff, I agree with a great deal of what he says on foreign policy, I understand that there are many people in this country, 68 million people in Britain, that, that would agree with certain things he says. I don't agree with them, but that's that's... That's part of being a journalist. Just because you talk to somebody about something doesn't mean that you're in agreement with them. Sometimes people find that hard to understand. But anyway, when he said what he said, my jaw dropped. I, I, I just, I was thinking, what on earth are you doing? You know, it's one thing to say, look, I'm a social conservative. I believe in X, Y, Z, each to their own. But saying that gay people aren't normal. And by the way, he said equal. He then corrected himself afterwards. I said, you just said equal. Yet you voted for gay marriage, so you believe in equality under the law, but you've just said they're not equal. He said, no, I said not normal. So he did correct himself after then. Um, and I, I, we, we didn't want to misrepresent that. So in the Twitter copy, in the article I wrote about this, I've, I've not used that word equal. We've only focused on the point normal. Um, I also said to him, do you mean typical? 
because of course LGBT people are a minority. Okay, they're not typical. That's f- that's fine. Do you mean typical? No, he said. I mean normal. So this is somebody I'm interviewing, Michael. Um, I'm putting questions to him, which are a big part of audience really care about. And then he responded, and I gave him the space to respond. That is not an attack. That is not a gotcha. This is literally what George Galloway thinks in George Galloway's words. And we're a media organization. If somebody says something of real interest to our audience and the wider public, we're going to publicize that. That's what we do. That's the name of the game. We put a clip on Twitter and I think it's got, you know, it's got millions of views, whatever that means on Twitter these days. It's certainly got more than a million actual views. Um, the world and his wife commenting on it. And I think most people, even social conservatives, Michael, look at that and they think, what on earth is he saying? You know, I don't think X, Y, Z should be taught in schools or I'm worried about the sexualization of children or, or whatever. Lots of, you know, social conservatives say that stuff. But the idea that gay people aren't normal, you know, there's, there's millions of LGBT people in this country. Millions. That is, that's normal. You know, what's normal? Um, an Iranian British Marxist who founds a media company, a guy wearing a, a, a hat indoors, a Scotsman who's an autodidact who, who became obsessed with the cause of Palestinian liberation, you know, the best part of half a century ago. Is that normal? Are we, are we normal people? So uh, I found it a very strange term. Of course, it's a loaded term as well, because if somebody's not normal, that carries a certain stigma with it. And that's why I said, do you mean typical? Um, so I was very surprised at his response. And of course, we had to, we had to publish that. That's just, that's just how this that's just how this thing works. Um, the rest of the interview, by the way, is not just on that kind of stuff. It's on foreign policy. We talk about Iraq. We talk about so much other stuff. We'll turn to that in a moment. And uh, it was an open conversation. Um, he was very affable. There was no attack lines. I, I, people that watch downstream know I'm not like that. They know I'm not like that. In fact, I'm often criticized for not being like that. When I have something like Peter Hitchens or John Gray on, I want them to basically make the best possible example of their thinking and their argumentation for our audience to see, apprehend, and think about and learn from. That's why we're here, to inform people, give them the facts, make them better informed. Um, And so I was not trying to misrepresent or gotcha Galloway. All of the negative response to this, he he has brought upon himself. There was a great tweet I saw, you know, um, somebody somebody has finally worked out how to... um, undermine Galloway, let him talk at length, you know? It's the opposite of Richard Madeley on GMB and trying to, you know, prod and poke. No, this is, what, and this is what he thinks. Okay, that's what you think. I don't think it's okay morally, but I'm saying that's what you think. You're, and you're now attacking me for letting you communicate what you think to a broad audience. Clearly ridiculous. Uh, as you said, that wasn't all you talked about. Let's take a look at another clip from that interview. You mentioned Tony Blair. Did he ever want to invade Zimbabwe? Yeah, he told me so. He told me so. When I, uh, I'll tell you exactly where it was, outside the gentleman's lavatory in the library corridor, just a couple of weeks before the invasion, when I had my last attempt uh, to buttonhole him. And he said to me, I used to be able to mimic it, he said to me, if I could, I would invade Zimbabwe, Burma, as before he went to work for the Burmese junta, Iran, there may have been another so long ago now, but those three I can testify. He said if he could, he would invade in that final conversation I had with him before the war. The, the war with Iraq, the yeah. war in Iraq rather. Everything I told him in that conversation, by the way, came to pass, literally everything. I told them there's no Al-Qaeda in Iraq, but if you and Bush invade it, there will be 100,000 Al-Qaeda in Iraq. I only underestimate it. I uh, told them that this Islamist fanatic mindset would cascade around the whole world, and I correctly predicted it will end up here in this building, which it did. I pause at the monument to uh, PC Keith Palmer every morning as I go in, it was a friend of mine who was murdered by an Al-Qaeda-inspired knife man uh, on the carriage gates. And But for him, they would have been inside the building. So a couple of things to say there. I mean, I, I'd never considered that in terms of Tony Blair's international legacy, it could have been much worse. 
Imagine if he'd not just invaded Iraq, but also invaded Zimbabwe and Burma or Myanmar. Um, I also, though, thought, Aaron, that answer was, you know, obviously the answer about homosexuals was ridiculous, stupid, offensive. But, but the way he answered that, I thought was very interesting because it was this sort of, you've got this anti-imperialist critique of, of um, British foreign policy. But then the way he says sort of he, he pauses when he walks past the, the memorial of, of, of PC Keith Palmer. You know, it does seem like someone who is really trying to sort of appeal to people who have that sort of patriotic respect for people who fight terrorism. You know, it, it doesn't come across as a sort of wishy-washy liberal who just sort of thinks, you know, we shouldn't blame anyone for, you know, it's, it's do you know what I yeah. mean? It's sort of, it's very yeah. to the point. Um, I thought it was an impressive answer. Well, here's the thing. Galloway has always been like that. Okay. He's, he, he said this in the interview. So I'm not like Corbyn. I've never been like Corbyn. I'm not, um, I'm not a radical liberal. That's how he would put it. Uh, he's always had that sort of socially conservative bent to him. It's gotten a lot worse, by the way. Uh, there's a book he published in 2004, I'm Not the Only One. He talks about creating a rainbow nation and how we need to look after minorities. I mean, put that into counterpoint to what he says in that clip a few moments ago with regards to LGBT people. Um, so he, he's always been slightly social con a slightly socially conservative politician. I think that's gotten worse, like I say, with age or more pronounced with age. Um, and I think his line there about Palmer um, and about a, a respect and a veneration for the institutions of the British state, uh, that's not new. And I find this a really actually, and by the way, it's very popular. It's very popular. He, he would be somebody who says, scrap the House of Lords. Unique, let's have a unicameral, a single chamber, a unicameral sort of political settlement. Halve the number of MPs. Scrap police and crime commissioners. I'm a Republican, but I really admire the Queen and, and, and Prince Philip. That's the sort of thing he said. And he's, he said that. Um, and I think, I wonder, is that part of a wider political calculation where you say, in order to have these radical opinions on things, I need the permission to have them. So I'll lean into these sort of broadly comprehensible social conservative attitudes or, 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 or talking points, right? I think there's probably some of that. And I don't know where one ends and the other starts. I think, you know, he's talked at length about his his Catholic upbringing and whatnot, despite the fact he's had four wives. Uh, but park that for a moment. I, I think that part of his politics and his persona is very much real. And he told me himself in the interview, as he gets older, he's become more religious. Um, and so therefore more socially conservative. So I think it's partly a sort of political calculation, calculation on his part. And by the way, it works. It really works. It's very effective. But I also, I also do think he means it. And on the, um, and on the, the actual substance of what he said about Blair, Michael, Utterly extraordinary. Can you imagine if um, if Blair had led us into war in Zimbabwe, Burma, Iran? Christ, Michael, the British Empire at its peak in the late 19th century would struggle doing that, let alone, you know, medium-sized European power in the North Atlantic in the early 21st century. Just delusional. I find it remarkable, by the way, that people are still defending Tony Blair. Uh, but Bradshaw, speaking to Zoe Williams in The Observer or The Guardian recently, said that he thought he was right about Iraq. Zoe Williams didn't then think, oh, well, what was right about it? We have millions of Iraqis, Afghans, Iranians coming to Europe. I've spoken about this so many times um, because we have destroyed those countries. We have a policy of trying to make Iran as economically immiserated as possible. And then we wonder why Iranians come to Europe. You know, Blair, I think, was almost on an unconscious mission to create as many failed states as he possibly could. And you have the exact same people in politics sort of lauding Blair, then saying, oh, why do we have all the refugees coming to Europe? Because of the insane foreign policy decisions of people like Tony Blair. Uh, finally, on Galloway, and this is why it's important to interview him. Yes, he's a public figure. He's an MP. You absolutely need to um, talk to people in public office. He's been voted by many people in Rochdale. Uh, he won more votes in that by-election than all the major parties put together. Of course, you should talk to somebody like that, in my view, as a media organization. It doesn't mean you agree with them just by talking to them in order to illuminate what they think and their political objectives and ambitions are. And my view is you do that best over a two-hour conversation rather than snippets and gotchas on TV like Richard Maidley. Uh, but I have to say, I really enjoy talking to older people like Mr. Galloway, um, like Peter Hitchens, like John Gray. And they don't always have to be on the left. You learn a great deal, not just intellectually, but literal facts about things that happened and aren't on Wikipedia and aren't in books, which are really useful. Um, and I, I 
I really enjoy it. And I, I look at Galloway almost with sadness. Actually, I think he's something of a, he's an immensely successful politician. You know, he's been elected for four different constituencies. Churchill is the only guy who's beaten him, by the way. He's, he was on five. But I, I look at him with a certain sadness because I see somebody who could have been a game-changing national political figure. And he, he made and said some really stupid things. I'm sure he believed some of them. I'm sure he didn't believe others of them. And he wasn't a team player. Um, and I, he could have helped recast British politics, I think, after the Iraq war. I think he could have, with respect. Something went very wrong there. And it is a tragedy because he's an immensely talented political figure. He's an incredible orator. He's a very intelligent man. Um, he, he can be very personable. But he repeatedly screws himself over um, by, I think, trying to wind people up, upset people. Half the stuff he says on quote-unquote woke career, I'm not sure if he actually believes it. It's just he's trying to wind up liberals and the left. And like I say, that, that for me makes for a tragic political figure because he could have been part of something much bigger. He'll go down the history books as somebody who won you know, in four separate constituencies because that's, that's a pub quiz fact. People will be talking about that in 100 years. But anyway, really interesting conversation. I learned a hell of a lot. And like I say, a fascinating man, an interesting man. And, and Michael, we're in journalism. We're here to highlight interesting people, interesting stories. And George Galloway is certainly that. Um, very, very briefly, because we do want to wrap up. Um, they've won four councillors, the Workers' Party today. Um, you know, they're saying that's four times as many as Reform UK won. And Reform UK have a lot more money and a lot more press coverage. At the same time, I think Galloway sort of had said that that um, his new party would take away Labour's majority in Rochdale and sort of Labour have held on to the vast majority of their seats in Rochdale. They, they, they don't seem particularly under threat. Um, will he be disappointed in today's results? No. Uh, the way it works in Rochdale, not all council elections are the same. You know, you have all our elections in some places. I think only a third of the wards were up for grabs. Um, there was one ward, Michael. Uh, let me get this out. Really remarkable statistic. Central Rochdale in Rochdale, in 2021, 84.6% of people who voted, voted Labour. 84.6% in that ward. George Galloway's Workers' Party just won it. So I think that's a pretty strong indication that he's he's very, very likely to keep that seat in a general election. Um, their eyes are very much on the general election. They've announced hundreds of candidates for the general election. Um, they would obviously talk about what's going on in, I think, uh, Manchester. They had a candidate who took out Labour's deputy leader. They will talk about their candidate or the candidate they backed in the West Midlands mayoral race who made the difference in terms of Labour getting over the line or not. That's what they would say. Um, but th these elections are not a, a huge deal for the Workers' Party of Great Britain. And I think the results we've seen are very positive for them. They certainly indicate that Galloway would be re-elected in the general election. Let's wrap up there. We've covered a lot. Aaron, it's been a pleasure as always. Michael, my pleasure. People are saying I've got a filter. I think it's the camera. When the when the lights are low, then the, the camera does this. I've not got any filters. I'm not uh, a makeup influencer who's 18 on TikTok. You know, I'm I'm very happy to wear my wrinkles. Uh, we'll change the settings for next time. But you've got you've got great skin. I think it's having a young child. Sort of being a new father, I think, is really working for your for your image in many ways. Um do make sure you come back on Monday because there is going to be a hell of a lot to talk about. All of the talk on social media at the moment is about whether or not Susan Hall might have beaten Sadiq Khan. Um, now, I, I think I remember similar stories last year um, when it was Sadiq Khan versus Sean Bailey and Sadiq Khan. You know, it wasn't as comfortable as people thought it would be, but it was comfortable. So we, we potentially shouldn't read too much into this, but um, it is the case that in wards or, or you know parts of London where people generally vote for Sadiq Khan, the turnout has been exceptionally low and it has been higher in places that usually vote Tory. So that would be a massive upset. Um, so do make sure you come back to hear our analysis of what will have gone down. Um, for now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Have a fantastic weekend. Good night.